nullification. Where is God's plan going now? What's going to happen if the chosen people are wiped out? And that, that threat was there from the very beginning. You know, you go back to the story of Cain and Abel, and you can see God's plan coming under threat through man's sinfulness when Cain killed his brother Abel. And so it went on. And so we need to see this, this subtext, this sub-narrative of uh, God's promises, God's plan, apparently being threatened by what's going on. So that's the first point, that it's um, uh, an acute situation that Israel is really the sick man of Palestine. Now, why had it arisen? What was the character of <coughs> the condition? Well, we'd have to say that it was essentially spiritual. Now, I want to say this as carefully as I can, but that would be true of almost every malady, every situation that we want to think about in our human experience, that underlying that is something spiritual. That's certainly the case with Israel. Uh, sinful rebellion in the community <coughs> of faith. I call it the community of faith. That's just a, a descriptive title. In fact, of course, uh, they were more characterized by unbelief than by faith. But anyway, there was this almost systematic uh, rebellion. And so their condition was essentially a spiritual one because it arose from the breakdown of their relationship with God on their side. Their condition, therefore, was also predictable. It wasn't simply essentially spiritual. It could have been predicted by anyone who had an understanding of these things. Do you remember what Joshua said is in his last words to Israel in chapter 24, verse 20? If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. So God had done them good. He had brought them out of Egypt. He brought them into this pleasant land which was flowing with milk and honey, this promised land. And yet, because they had forsaken him, he had done them harm. And we can see that they were responsible for this. Uh, and that the outcome of it was predictable from the fact that in the story that we read in chapter 6, verse 25, um, Gideon receives a command from the Lord to pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah beside it. Now the Asherah was a, a tree or a, a pole. It was the goddess of fertility and Asherah was the god of fertility as well as the god of that. Baal was the god of fertility and of the storm. The point is that these idols and idol worship had found their way into the church. That's the whole point. Has idolatry come into the church today? I'm not just talking about the worship of icons and of images or the veneration of them, to be more accurate. But I'm talking about all kinds of ideas and practices that Christians seem to think are essential to what they understand to be the worship of God. God has never sanctioned them. God has never asked them, uh, asked us to, to engage in them. But somehow or other, they have found themselves, they, their way into the church. And so, what happened to Israel and what's happening to the church today is predictable. And that process is also virulent. Uh, in 1 Timothy 2.17, Paul says that the, the false teaching that was going on in the church of Ephesus was spreading like a gangrene. And that's what happens. Once the process begins, it's exceedingly difficult to put the brakes on it and to contain it 
and to eliminate it. And so uh, it was a, a virulent kind of malady that was to be found in Israel and the effects of it were profound. So we're getting, we're getting a number of adjectives coming out here. It was essentially spiritual, it was predictable, it was virulent, it was profound. Israel was greatly impoverished, we are told in verse 6 of chapter 6. They were living a literal hand-to-mouth existence. They had a culture of fear. And you know, uh, in uh, Sunday school this morning, before we had our lesson, we, we learned about the situation in Eritrea. And uh, there's a pastor there, I happen to know him, spent time with him. And uh, he, he's a man who has been hounded out of house and home, he lives in hiding, his wife is under severe restrictions, and, um, and, and, and uh, the, the situation is terrible there. The church, the church is suffering in a profound way. Now I'm not suggesting that in the case of the Eritrean church, it's their fault. I'm, I'm inclined to think the opposite, in fact, of those people because they stood up for Jesus. But in the case of Israel, their suffering was profound and it couldn't be reversed, That's at least not by anything that they did. It seems to me that they've gone past the point of being able to reform themselves, to repent and turn back to God. That's the problem. Once you go down that road to a certain point, it's almost impossible to turn back. And, and behind all of this, you've got the lurking shadow of the hand of God. Would you believe it? Look at verse 1. How does it start? The Lord gave them into the hands of Midian. The Lord delivered them into the hands of their enemies. This was the Lord's doing. Of course, it's directly related to their doing, their disobedience. But all that happened to them was in the way of a judicial punishment. So, their situation was acute, and uh, they were in great need, and it's clear that only God could rescue them. What does that mean for us today? I've, I've hinted at a, a, a few thoughts on this. One is this, that God rewards disobedience, and he rewards compromise by his people by giving them what they want. Isn't that something awful? He gives us what we want. Now, what are we talking about? We are talking about departing from the Word of God. You see, that kind of compromise always involves a departure from Scripture. It's the regulative principle of life, if you like, not just of worship, but of the whole of life. And when we do that, we are just piling up trouble for ourselves because when we go after other things in preference to what God demands of us, expects of us, wants from us, then we are likely to get what we are looking for. Psalm 106 verse 15, the people who came out of Egypt full of complaints and rebellion, what does it say? He gave them what they asked but sent a wasting disease among them. I like the old King James Version. Uh, he gave them the desire of their heart and sent leanness to their soul. That's basically it. So watch out. If you want to wander away from the Lord, you will know that you're doing it. He might give you exactly what you want, as he did Israel. And uh, they eventually uh, came into bondage and the things that they wanted became a bondage to them, became a snare, a trap to them and therefore they fell into abject need. And of course what the, uh, the Bible is doing here is painting a picture in which the only solution is sovereign grace. There is no other, no other solution. These people can't do anything. They want something to be done, but they can do nothing because they're up against it. 
and so they're entirely dependent upon God. But it was their own fault, it was their own choice, and it could have been avoided. Okay. Spiritual diagnosis. Here we have it, verses 6 through 8. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, so it was hurting, they said, ouch, the Lord sent a prophet. You could say this is God's house doctor. You know, he's not a Moses. He's just a, a, a regular guy, an ordinary, an ordinary preacher, nothing particularly spectacular about him uh, but he's a conveyor of the word of God that was his job he was a prophet he's the house doctor he's not a he's not a great healer not a great healer miraculous healer he's not a deliverer he's not a messianic figure he's just a prophet he's not telling the future he's telling the present and the past and if you look at it that's exactly what he talks about. He gives them God's verdict. He gives them God's diagnosis. He tells them why this has happened. Verses 8 and 9, he said, I, God said that to you. I said that to you. But you, verse 10, have not listened to me. It was ever thus. And you can imagine when a man like that comes along, just a regular preacher preaching the word of God, nothing fancy, straight down the line, straight off the page of scripture, analyzing the situation, applying the truth. People are going to react to that. We don't want to hear that stuff. That makes me feel bad. And uh, you know, we just want you to fix the problem. Just get us out of this and, and, and that'll be fine, the quick fix. Well, uh, a man called Dale Ralph Davis, who's written a number of popular commentaries uh, on these historical books, you ought to get them and read them, very readable style. He says this, do we sometimes wonder at the inappropriate answers God gives to our urgent need? Here we are, desperate, we've got these midi